So Hume starts section two with the real uh, work of the abstruse philosophy. He starts out by talking about the origins of our ideas. Um, he, he makes the claim that all of our mental uh, contents, or as he calls it, our perceptions, or perceptions of the mind, uh, are of, of one of two types. So he's saying everything that there is in our minds is of, of one of two types. It's either an what he calls an impression or an idea. And he's going to start making this distinction in the first paragraph. So he writes in the first paragraph, everyone will readily allow that there is a considerable difference between the perceptions of the mind when a man feels the pain of excessive heat or the pleasure of moderate warmth and when he afterwards recalls to his memory this sensation or anticipates it by his imagination. These faculties may mimic or copy the perceptions of the senses, but they can never entirely reach the force and vivacity of the original sentiment. The utmost we say of them, even when they operate with greatest vigor, is that they represent their object in so lively a manner that we could almost say we feel or see it. So he's asking you to distinguish between cases where you actually see, for instance, a bonfire and where you just imagine a bonfire. And one of these cases, he says, has more force and vivacity than the other one, namely the case where you actually see a bonfire in front of you, where you're looking at a bonfire. Um, the memory is less vivacious and has less force. All the colors of poetry, <clears throat> oh, sorry, but except the mind be disordered by disease or madness, they never can arrive at such a pitch of vivacity as to render these perceptions altogether undistinguishable. So people who are crazy, or if we're in a state of, of, uh, of madness, perhaps, you know, by having taken a drug or, you know, just gone off the deep end for some reason, then we might perceive our um, memories as, as vivacious, as something that's directly in front of us. But normally that doesn't happen. All the colors of poetry, however splendid, can never paint natural objects in such a manner as to make the description be taken for a real landscape. The most lively thought is still inferior to the dullest sensation. So um, our sensations are very lively and vivacious. Our thoughts about those sensations are much less lively and vivacious. Skipping a paragraph and going a little further, Hume writes, here, therefore, we may divide all the perceptions of the mind into two classes or species, which are distinguishable by their different degrees of force and vivacity. The less forcible and lively are commonly denominated thoughts or ideas. Thoughts or ideas. So he gives two names for those. The other species want a name in our language and in most others. I suppose because it was not requisite for any but philosophical purposes to rank them under a general term or appellation. Let us therefore use a little freedom and call them impressions, employing that word in a sense somewhat different from the usual. By the term impression, then, I mean all our more lively perceptions, when we hear or see or feel or love or hate or desire or will. And impressions are distinguished from ideas, which are the less lively perceptions of which we are conscious when we reflect on any of those sensations or movements above mentioned. And at this point, Hume presents a thesis about the relation between impressions and ideas. He says, all ideas come from impressions. So his, what he's imagining here is that we have sensations which are very vivid and forceful and they may be sensations of things inside us too, like emotions, as well as things outside us. Um, but our uh, ideas of things, like when we reflect, when we remember, or we call to mind the idea of a horse or a dog, even though a horse or a dog isn't present at the moment, what we're doing is we're kind of calling to mind a, a, a pale uh, imitation or reflection, um, a kind of copy, an internal copy of something that's um, experienced in a more forceful and vivid way when we have a direct impression of it. And if we never had an impression of a horse or a dog, it'd be very, very hard for us to have the idea of a horse or a dog, basically impossible. 
Um, it is true we can have ideas of all kinds of things that Hume recognizes that. I mean, the, we can have the idea of a gold mountain, a mountain made entirely of gold, for instance, which probably doesn't exist anywhere. Um, but we can have that idea. But where does the idea come from? It comes, Hume thinks, from our impressions of gold things and our impressions of mountains put together in some way, right? So we've had impressions in the past, experiences in the past, that we're able to combine in our minds to make the idea of something like a gold mountain or of a unicorn, which is, you know, a combination of a horse and the kind of horn that we could see on other things. Uh, and so this is where all ideas come from, according to you. All ideas have their origins, ultimately, in impressions. And Hume offers two arguments for this thesis. So uh, he, he claims that if we ever examine any of our ideas, you know, all we have to do is just look at any one of the ideas that we have. And he says, he challenges us to find any idea that doesn't come from impressions, ultimately. Uh, whatever idea we look at, he says, we look at it carefully, we'll see it's a combination of uh, ideas that we have that have come from some impressions that we've had. So that's his first argument. His second argument is that a person who has never had a specific kind of impression will also lack the corresponding ideas. So you think about a blind person, for instance, there are a lot of, um, they're not going to be able to have the idea of red because they've never had an impression of red, okay? Or you think his example is, he says a, one of his examples is a Laplander or a Laplander is a person who lives in Lap, the Laplands, which is, um, which is Northern Finland and other uh, um, Scandinavian countries. Um, or a Negro, what a person from Africa, uh, who's, Hume is writing at this time in the um, 19th century, I'm sorry, the 18th century, that he says these people don't have an, an idea of the relish of wine, meaning basically an alcohol bever alcoholic beverage made from fermented grapes, because they've never had an experience of that. So if you imagine a person in a tribe in Africa who who never had a taste of wine, then they wouldn't know what the idea of wine is. Likewise, for a person who lives in Northern Finland who'd never had the taste of wine. So we need to have an impression before we can have an idea of something. That's the second argument that Hume gives here. So at this point, I just wanna pause for a moment and invite you to ask yourself whether you agree with the claim that all perceptions of the mind are impressions or ideas. Does this cover everything? Is there anything else in the mind than impressions um, or ideas? Or is Hume right that he's, you know, that he's canvassed everything that there is in the mind? And then secondly, do you agree with his thesis that all ideas come from impressions, that this is where um, every idea that we have ultimately comes from?